So just by attending today, um, you're getting access to some, some very valuable free training courses once they're developed. Um, however, there's a, a, an, an axiom of economic development and of economies in general that there is no free lunch. Although you're not paying for lunch today, this is just as true today. We're asking, our, we have four leaders in their respective fields, and we think this is going to be highly educational. We're going to hold questions to the focus group session after each of the speakers finishes, where we will serve lunch. But we're asking each of you to take close notes. We're going to open the floor to your questions. So feel free to interact, ask, ask your deepest desires and questions of our panelists. But we also have a few questions we'll ask of you. So we're asking you to work just a little bit for the, the lunch that's, that's served later. We're hoping that you educate us as much as we educate you today. So our first speaker today, without much more fanfare, Philip Bernstein is an architect and technologist. He's associate dean and lecturer in professional practice at the Yale School of Architecture, where he has taught since 1988. Uh, Philip was formerly a vice president at Autodesk, where he was responsible for setting the company's future vision and strategy for technology, as well as cultivating and sustaining the firm's strategic relationships with industry. Phil was the executive responsible for Autodesk's Waltham AEC headquarters project, which received more than 14 major architectural awards. Prior to joining Autodesk, he practiced architecture as a principal at Pelly Clark Pelly Architects, where he managed many of the firm's most complex commissions. Mr. Bernstein writes and lectures extensively about practice and technology and has been published in Architectural Record, Fast Company, and Fortune Magazine. Phil was the co-editor of The Building in the Future, Recasting Labor and Architecture, published in 2010 by Princeton Architectural Press, as well as BIM in the, in the Academy, Technology's Implications for Practice in the Academy in 2011. Uh, he's currently writing a book for Burkhauser Publishers on the intersection of design methods, technology, and architectural practice. Phil has been honored twice by Design Intelligence as one of the 30 most admired educators in architecture. He received a, a Bachelor of Arts magna cum laude with distinction in architecture from Yale University and a Master of Architecture also from Yale. Uh, Phil is also a senior fellow of the Design Futures Council a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and former chair of the AIA National Contract Documents Committee. Um, he's also licensed to practice in California. With that, Philip Bernstein. Yikes, between that lengthy bio and those looking at pictures of myself, I'm kind of freaked out. So um, <laughs> give me a second to get the technology going here. Actually, so I really appreciate the offer to come down and talk to you guys today. Uh, during my practice career, I, um, as was mentioned, I work for the architect Cesar Pelli, and I was actually the design manager on the Adrian Arts um, Performing Arts Center here in town. So I spent a lot of time on Biscayne Boulevard and a lot of time on South Beach drinking beer to recover from the time I spent on Biscayne Boulevard. Uh, those of you who are familiar with that project, and it is famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, uh, know that it was, um, as we said, we were all very young architects at that time. It was a learning experience for all of us to be building here in Miami. Um, I'm going to um, admit that when I was first invited um, by Shaheen to speak here, I declined because <laughs> I said, I'm not, really a, I'm not really any kind of an expert in robotics. But what I am really interested in is how technology in general changes the systems in which we operate um, as uh, AEC cluster professionals, and particularly how technology is uh, an, both an opportunity uh, and a kind of obligation to rethink those kinds of relationships. So what I want to talk about uh, today uh, is some of the work that I've been doing and things that I've been thinking about uh, uh, with regard to how the value propositions of the building industry are actually going to be um, remediated as different kinds of technologies begin to become part of the process that, that we work in. Uh, the, um, the, this question of 
this, this discussion about technology being making fundamental changes um, in our industry has been um, around for a while, and it's been it's being it's now being changed or it's being kind of bent by this question of autonomy. We were we were we were really operating originally in a context of what I would call automation, which was using computers to do things that we used to do by hand more quickly. But now we're into a, a, a different type of autonomy, which includes technology that has the quote unquote freedom to act independently of humans, which is one of the, I think one of the big questions that we're going to be talking about during the day today. But also um, at kind of acting in accordance with one's moral duty, which are the two different definitions of autonomy. And when we come to this, when we come to this question of moral duty, what we're really talking about is the the socioeconomic effects of the kinds of things that Shaheen was just talking about relative to the workforce and our responsibility to that workforce. And so in my view, and I think this is the reason I was asked to come talk here today, we have to think about these questions not just in terms of technological enthusiasm or what I um, like to describe as the instrumentality of technology, but more in terms of how technology and automation change the fundamental relationships of the, in the building industry and how we can uh, work on those problems in concert. So one of the most interesting examples of this, um, uh, of this question that I've been uh, thinking about lately is why exactly is it that people build stuff? What is the, what is the underlying motivation for human beings to, to build things? And I was listening to my favorite podcast, which is called 99% Invisible. If you don't, it's up by a guy on the West Coast named Roman Mars. And he, he talks about, you know, Bucky Fuller said that all design is 99% invisible. So he, he did a podcast a couple of weeks ago about this guy named Kirkbride. And Kirkbride was uh, the inventor of what we know today as the modern insane asylum. But back when, he, when Kirkbride invented this insane asylum, he was actually trying, he had a completely different vision than one that I'm sure I just conjured up in your minds about insanity. Uh, he felt that one could build buildings that would actually make people healthier, that it would actually improve their mental health. And he had a theory that if he could construct his buildings in a certain, kinds of, certain kind of ways, he could improve the mental health of his patients. So he had a very, very outcome-based thesis about what the, the act of building was all about. And I, that's going to be an important part of this discussion as we go forward. But first, let's, take, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about technology. I, want, I just want to read you a, a brief quote here. In no more than 30 years, computers may be intelligent or more intelligent than people. The machine may be able to handle not only the planning, but the complete mechanical assembly of things as well. Some computers now have scanners attached to them, so they can see drawings. Eventually, computers will have hands, vision, and the programs that will make them able to assemble buildings, making them at very high rates of speed economically. Contractors will have to face automation in the construction, just as architects will have to face automation of design. Eventually, I believe computers will be formidable of formidable creative capacity. So I think that's an excellent thesis statement for um, today's discussion. Uh, unfortunately, Marvin Minsky wrote this in uh, 1964 when he was speculating about the role of computers that had you know, one ten thousandth of the computing power of my iPhone here. We've been having this conversation about the dramatic, transformative implications of technology in the building industry. It's going on a half a century now. And the question is, what, what are the dimensions of that problem that we have to think through? And so when I, I left Autodesk in 2016 and before I took my job as the associate dean at, at Yale, I actually finished that book that was mentioned earlier and started exploring this question of how do three issues interact in, the, in a realm where technology is changing an industry like ours. The first question I was asking myself is, how does it change the roles and responsibilities of the players? How do architects, engineers, contractors, owners interact with one another in, a, in circumstances where technology is transforming things? Then what does that mean in terms of how they do their work? What, is, what, are the, what are the kinds of methodologies that are necessary? And then the third question was what I called value. How, does that, how do the business propositions, the value exchanges, the connections between those players get restructured in a world where technology is just a catalyst, but we have to operate in another kind of system. I mean, if Minsky was right and those kinds of transformative influences were actually possible back in 1964, why are we still having this conversation in 2019? 
And we had it in, in 1984 when AutoCAD came out. Uh, we had it in, the, in 2002 when old BIM extravaganza at Autodesk. And now we're, and now we're having it again. And so let, let's talk a little bit about that, that context. And I'm now going to describe for you the entire history of AEC technology in two slides. I've been practicing this a lot because I've been doing this, giving a lot of talks on this. So, okay, so, um, whoops, whoops, I skipped ahead. First thing that we did for, for 5,000 years is we drew stuff, right? We drew, that's how, that was the primary information transfer exchange. In the building industry, extremely efficient, very cheap. Uh, my former colleague from Yale, Mario Carpo, who studies the history of architectural representation, said that drawing is an incredibly efficient CPU strategy because you, you've got a huge amount of information encoded in a very, very inexpensive idea, like a line. Uh, then in the 80s, we started drawing things in CAD. CAD felt like a really, really big deal. Really wasn't, because it was really just drawing things using a computer. You know, I, I, and, and in doing so, made all the skills that I had as an architect who grew up and graduated from school in the 80s and was trained in the analog world, rendered all my skills obsolete. It didn't really advance the proposition very far. Then we went through the whole BIM extravaganza, where in theory, there was a disruption in the means of representation. We went from, in theory, drawing buildings in the abstract using diagrams to making three-dimensionally, informationally robust, provocative uh, digital twins, shall we say, of projects. That was what's supposed to happen. And then we overlay the accelerators of cloud computing and mobile computing. And so cloud computing solves Mario's problem. We're no longer bound by any kind of CPU problem because you can apply an infinite number of compute cycles and storage to any problem, which is great because building things, it takes a lot of compute cycles. And you can deliver that information anywhere to the point of work. So we're in some fourth thing, and I don't know what it is. It's data-enabled AECO something connected BIM. Some marketing genius can come up with that. My team came up with the term BIM. Somebody else can come up with this. Next one now, and what's happening now is everybody has their favorite list of transformative technologies that are going to change the building industry. You know, here's mine, big data, generative, industrialized construction, analysis and simulation, the internet of things, machine learning, there's computer vision, there's, I mean, make your own favorite list. Um, but there are clearly a set of interrelated technologies that are supplanting this idea that we've had for a very long time in AEC which is there's one interesting technology, right? There's one thing that's going on that we're super focused on. We're really focused on CAD, and we're really focused on BIM. Well, I think that, as we'll talk about today, we're gonna have to be really focused on a bunch of different stuff, and as Kevin mentioned earlier, there is a lot of innovative activity going on in all these things. This is a, just a, a sample of various startups that are operating in all of these disruptive technologies, which is a really dramatic change from even say 2010, where a, a technology investment in the building industry was mostly made by companies like the one that I used to work for. Now, in my view, these six, te these six technologies have a kind of self-reinforcing influence on the operating model of the building industry. They actually relate in ways that are interconnected by the building enterprise, but have a subtext of project delivery systems and value propositions. And you can start to see, and I won't go through this in a lot of data, in a lot of detail, but you can start to see that there are kind of self-reinforcing uh, data flows between things like big data and analysis, and between things like computation and simulation. You, need, you can be generating alternatives with a computational approach, like a script, but you need a tool to evaluate those options. You can be um, generating ideas with, through computational design strategies, but you need a machine learning algorithm to sort those things organize them and generate insight for them. So you end up with this kind of very interesting set of um, interconnections that make the complex of technology create a new informational infrastructure during the design process. And then ultimately when you build a building, you, you get all these other kinds of informational artifacts. The informational artifacts that used to come from a construction project were drawings of various degrees of fidelity, specs that nobody paid any attention to, and piles and piles of paper that are now piles and piles of digital files, but they're not in any kind of coherent model. And this information complex that's starting to emerge creates a, um, an epistemology, a knowledge structure about how the building industry could move forward. But if we continue to think about the problem as just the application of disparate instruments, like 
What are we going to do with computer vision? Can we really leverage BIM? How about some robots? None of this stuff will coalesce in a way that really can attack the sort of value propositions that Kevin was talking about. And the, the, the underlying thesis that I'd like to put forward here is that this, con this com combination of technologies, this ability to manage information and insight, creates a fundamentally different value proposition in the building industry. The building industry is largely predicated on commodification, lowest first cost value exchanges. And now with this information complex that I've just described to you, we can get into a world of measuring things, which speaking as an architect is something I only have limited um, capability to do. That measurement suggests that we can actually simulate things, and those simulations allow us to predict that things are going to happen. And once we've gotten into a, 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 a construct where we can predict outcomes, that, that could be the catalyst that refactors the value propositions of the industry that allows us to take full advantage of ideas like autonomy. And there are all, there's all sorts of evidence of these kinds of ideas beginning to emerge whose value propositions are not entirely clear. This is a project that Autodesk did a couple of years ago. Pretty simple idea. A series of algorithms that optimize the construction strategy for a precast concrete building. This designer has decided that she's going to do a building in precast. This algorithm just figures out where's the best place to put the crane? Where's the best place to deliver the panels? Where's the best place to or orchestrate the labor force? What's interesting about this is that it's a bit of, of insight that is available not just after the project has been completely designed, but rather available to the designers during the design process. So that information complex that I described to you has to have a kind of circular nature where, it, where insight can, be, can move in both directions around the supply chain. And, and the combination of these kinds of technologies begins to break down the traditional barriers between design capabilities, construction capabilities, and building operation capabilities. So what I talked about in my book in these three categories that I introduced to you earlier was that the introduction of different kinds of technologies has the possibility of changing the fundamental system in which we all operate. And since my book was primarily targeted toward um, uh, students and younger architects, here's how I frame the problem for the architects. Said, in the current state that we're in, what you do for a living is you do this thing called design intent. I'm looking for the contractors to start shifting around in their seats, right? Because nobody really understands what design intent is. Um, I like to describe to my students that design intent is where you make a bunch of drawings that depict how you wish the building will be after the contractor is doing whatever it is they're going to do to your building. And when you give them those drawings, you dare them to build the building from your drawings. I dare you to build this building from this set of working drawings. Haven't talked to you very much while we put it all together. It's based on a bunch of really good guesses on my part about how I think things are going to work, but good luck. I, I wish you well. And then methodologically, how that works is lots of iteration, like lots of looping, design loops, trying things, generating alternatives, lots of intuition, right? I'm an architect. You hired me to exercise my judgment, but my outputs are all fixed deliverables. Here's an SD set, a DD set, CD set. It's all, it's all fixed commoditized deliverables. But the value proposition has nothing to do with any of that stuff. It's all commodification. It's all lowest first cost. It's what um, uh, John Taylor, who was a grad student at Stanford when he did a project for me many years ago, now he's a tenured professor at, at Virginia Tech, which tells you how old I'm getting. Um, he, he described the building industry as suboptimized to the point of failure. Suboptimization to failure. Everybody optimizes their own little silo, and then you hook up a bunch of suboptimized silos and what you get is a, what you get is a, a, an overall system that's kind of failed. And the, in the design profession, I, I need some similar charts from the construction profession. But in the design profession, what you end up with is value propositions, in other words, fees that are largely commoditized. When you look at the data about how architects and designers are paid, what you see is a vast majority of the fees that architects are paid are some version of a commodification, a purchase for lowest price without a value proposition. It has very little to do with the value the service is provided. The driver is who can buy the services for the lowest cost. And so if you were going to apply technology to not just the instrumentation of a problem, but to the value proposition, you might end up with a different kind of future state. You might end up in a state where there's a, a much less bright divide between design intent and execution. Some kind of information has got to drive all these autonomous devices that we're talking about in construction. 
And that information control, the control of information flows through the system becomes just as important as the defining of the design because design becomes a problem of the interaction of, that, of those data flows that I showed you earlier. That methodology is still, uh, still relies on my judgment and I'll never find a computer or a robot that will make a building work well or be beautiful. But what, it, uh, the, what that automation will allow me to do is systematically explore a problem, make sure that I found all the correct alternatives, simulate a series of outcomes, provide rational analysis about what's going to happen to this project as I'm designing it, and, and uh, supplement my recommendations as a designer or a builder with analytical conclusions that are based on rational evaluation and simulation. And what that allows you to do is change the value proposition to one that's about making things happen instead of buying things for the lowest first cost. And my thesis, undeveloped as it is, as I'll explain it to you here today, is that that is the denominator, that's the project delivery denominator that will enable these kinds of technologies that we're talking about all day today to actually mean something so we don't repeat what we did in the CAD world, which is essentially replace an old inefficient process with a slightly less and now old inefficient process. So if you're going to do this, I'm going to put forth a few, four or five provocations that have to happen if we're going to get to a world where these, this value proposition is possible and we can begin to leverage the idea of the autonomy, the, the autonomous potential of tech, technology. And number one, time for drawings to be dead. It's time for us to get to move away from a world that is completely reliant on drawings. This drawing on the left is my absolute favorite drawing in the world. It's drawn by a, a, a stonemason of, um, named Robert Smithson in 1499. It's called a round window in a round wall which is a, it's a, it's a rose window, but it's a complex curve because it's curving in the elevation plane and it's curving in plan. It took him exactly one drawing to explain how that, how that thing was supposed to be built. And that one drawing had all the, all the dimensions, all the fabrication instructions, everything that was necessary to build that, that window. Now, of course, it probably took him 20 years to build that window which might not work in today's building industry, but somebody tell me how many shop drawings it would take to build that window in 2019 in Miami. And if you tell me less than 200, you're smoking something, right? So we've, we've, we've gotten to a point where drawings as a technique are no longer adequate for the job. On the right is a more modern drawing. This is a shop drawing from the Petronas Tower, which was a building in Malaysia that we were working on in Pelly's office um, in the late 80s. And that, that drawing, that, that is essentially a computerized version of a hand drawing whose life was spent, mostly spent in FedEx tubes going back and forth across the world while we tried to define this project and get it built. And the proposition is that maybe we could replace that with more modern deliverables. This is, this is, these are some of the design and construction deliverables from the LaGuardia Airport project, which is going on up in New York right now. I think it's about a $5 billion project. Um, these images came from Skanska. They were created by um, one of my former students believe it or not, a Yale architecture grad who was the senior BIM manager for Skanska, where he wrote a specification and demanded that all primary data exchanges be in three dimensions, and that all the primary systems and, and fundamental exchanges of information between design and construction were high resolution and in 3D. So not only did he design those protocols, he also designed this informational system by which, inf by which this data was gonna flow. So he took responsibility not just for managing the process, but for managing the interactions as well. And, and building information modeling, in theory, could be this um, informational infrastructure of this problem. Because the theory of building information modeling is that it's a highly transparent, everyone can get to it, high resolution, three-dimensional, isn't, isn't everything great technology where we can all play nicely together in the sandbox. And this image on the left is one of my favorite BIM images. This is when I was at Autodesk, one of our customers was doing this hospital. And you look at that image and you're like, wow, this building must be perfect. This thing must be great. Look at this. They've, not only have they modeled every single thing in this building in beautiful three dimensions, it's even color coded. How could there ever be a problem with this building and this project must have gone really, really great, right? But what's really true, if we're honest with ourselves, now that I'm unbound from my Autodesk corporate masters by a few years and I'm an academic and I can say whatever I want, largely BIM is being used to do what you see on the right, which is make better working drawings, right? Which means BIM, is, it's possible that BIM is going to be the CAD of the 21st century. 
We're just going to do the same old stuff better, slightly better than we were doing it before. Faster, right? The team that generated those drawings on the right was half the size or a third of the size it was when I was drawing those things with plastic lead on mylar. But is it really any better? Better coordinated? Got some really important things? Absolutely right. Like all those detail call out bubbles and cross references are absolutely correct. But are we getting better buildings out of this? And I would argue maybe we are not. And so maybe the problem is not the technology. Maybe the problem is the risk return relationships and that we actually ought to start looking at different kinds of risk return relationships to leverage the possibilities of automation. And so the, one of the strategies that we've always used to try to improve the risk return relationship is messing around with traditional project delivery models. This is a diagram from my book that explains the, the history of American project delivery from 1970 to 2020 as a series of experiments in refactoring the relationship between design, construction, and building ownership. But largely hasn't really worked, right? We haven't really seen any of these kinds of improvements. And the reason we haven't seen these improvements is that our processes, these commodified processes that we use, have fundamental structural problems that create information discontinuities in the handoffs. This is a kind of dumb drawing of the basic phases of how a project unfolds on the, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the reliability of information. And the problem is that in each successive phase of a project, information gets increasingly reliable until it gets collapsed down and handed off to the next group. And it's particularly bad when it's paper, but it hasn't really improved very much digitally as well. The worst one of these, of course, is, is, this, is this break from here to here and then from here to here because at the end of construction, when in theory the insight about the project is at its maximum possible point, it's then plotted out on pieces of paper. They're nice because they were all produced in building information modeling and handed to the contractor who then has to begin rebuilding insight again through the bid process, through construction, until a moment, 10 or 12 minutes before the keys are handed over to the owner where knowledge amongst the AEC cluster team on that project is at its maximum. And then everybody goes, hands over a bunch of drawings or maybe a bunch of Revit models that the client doesn't know what to do with and then blows town, right? And, the, and I, you know, I, I wanted, my German graphic designer on my book made this look super pretty, but I probably should have drawn this thing down here, right? Because the owner's looking at their you know, asset going, now, now what am I supposed to do? So we have to, we have to kind of break this construct. And one way to break this construct is to build a new theory of how AEC cluster participants can assume risk. And I, I don't want to get into too much detail here because it's not very, this is not a very sophisticated idea quite yet, but the thesis here is that Building things is risky, and assuming and managing risk is a value proposition. And if we can use technology to predict outcomes, why not be use technology as a, as a risk lever? And maybe there are strategies for doing that. We could, we could do low-level things, mitigating risk like making fewer mistakes. Clients don't find that super interesting. We could uh, kind of do middle-level ideas like work together to make the construction process more smooth, do more accurate um, cost estimates, um, accelerate schedules to give projects, give clients their projects faster, anticipate owner changes, I'm climbing up the risk curve here. But ultimately, our clients build buildings in order to do things, and we may get to a point in the future where we can say to a client, well, we, we, can, we can prove to clients the things that I know at least a lot of architects say in the interview and then hope the contract divorces them from that when they actually execute the project. This is gonna be a great project. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to make your patients healthier. It's going to do all the things that you want to do, except for don't hold me responsible for any of that stuff because by virtue of my lowest first cost design contract, that, that isn't going to work. And so the question is, where does automation, which is the topic of this discussion, give us opportunities to drive these new kinds of value propositions? And, and at this point, I really want to return to Mr. Kirkbride because what Kirkbride was really saying is, the built environment makes things happen. And the question for us as an industry is, can we begin to leverage some of these, uh, these, these autonomous technologies to get to that same point? And you're starting to see the emergence of some of those kinds of ideas. The Internet of Things, for example, is a way of collecting information about how, you know, this is a Kirkbride asylum from 1849. This is a modern, you know, 21st century hospital that has a ton of sensors connected to it that collect information about things that are actually happening in that building that can provide part of this kind of virtuous loop that we're talking about. And you're starting to see the emergence of some of those kinds of strategies in practice. This is the Philadelphia firm of Kieran Timberlake. 
They do a lot of renovation work. And when they do a renovation, they do something that doesn't seem shocking, but is, would, is going to make the architects in the room's blood run cold. They go out and put sensors on the building and say, here's the thermal performance of your existing wall. And when we finish the renovation, your wall's gonna perform like this. And then they put sensors on the building when it's done, and then when the building actually performs as described, they get paid for that. Doesn't seem like a huge deal, except for it is a huge deal because the value propositions and structures that we use to do this don't exist right now, but the technologies do. And we're the mo one of the most evident um, examples of that is in the structural engineering business, where as, an, as, an architect, as a grad student in architecture, I trained using formulas like the ones on the left, which are abstraction strategies. But you, you, using a formula uh, today is like doing math by hand before you learn how to do arithmetic because we have simulation platforms that extremely precisely predict how a structural frame is going to behave. We can predict that thing with a great deal of precision, and there's no reason why that won't be the case going forward into the future around all kinds of things. This is some work that my faculty colleague Anna Dyson is doing where she's correlating the performance of a building's exterior envelope with biometric data from the building's occupants. So she's saying if my envelope is designed like X, the cortisol stress levels of my occupants inside the building are Y. So you're starting to see the extension of these kinds of analytical and conclusive ideas coming forward. And this, this same proposition applies very directly to the question at hand here of this conference, which is the outcome that this uh, brick-laying assistive robot is trying to accomplish is a design idea about an enclosure and a wall that originated on the design side and requires a tremendous amount of information and insight to deliver, but right now we are in danger of repeating the same crimes that the industry has, has committed over the course of uh, all the te technology development, which is the designers decide they want a brick wall, and the robot controllers have to re-represent the wall in some other digital way in order to take advantage of the efficiency here. And that doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because there's no business proposition that connects that designer with the inputs of this particular robot. And all of these strategies for autonomous construction, whether they are um, you know, some of the stuff that's going on at Eteha or uh, you know, Cuckoo's on tracks doing building components. This is a really interesting project going on at Autodesk right now where um, they are using robots to simulate to, to, as remote construction workers doing dangerous things. In this case, they're installing a piece of glass into a curtain wall where you, you, know, you don't want the guy to fall out the wall onto the street below. So he's using an, 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 uh, an ARVR environment to install that piece of glass. The, the point here being that all of these activities represent a convergence of different kinds of insight, construction logic, design, a construction approach, materiality, that don't operate well today because the value propositions are not there to interconnect them. And uh, I, 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 wanna, um, I wanna mention that one of the um, distinctions I draw to make this less terrifying um, is this distinction. Uh, one of the questions that you hear in a lot, amongst a lot of designers these days is, are all, is all this automation gonna make us obsolete? You, don't, you just don't, you know, if you got a computer program that tells you how the doors swing in a building and how wide the exit corridors have to be and where the two hour wall separations go, do you really need, how many architects do you need after that? And I think the answer to that question falls into, um, it falls into some work that was done uh, by um, uh, an architect and teacher at Harvard named Peter Rowe back in the 80s and 90s. And Peter Rowe talked about this idea of designing things or solving complex problems as a wicked problem a wicked problem is one that it doesn't lend itself to an algorithm. It doesn't have a clear entry point to begin with. It doesn't have a clear ending point. You're not quite sure exactly how you're gonna get from here to here. You employ what he calls heuristics, which are intuitive strategies for making things happen. Building buildings, designing buildings, building buildings, always gonna be a wicked problem. But it, 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 those projects, those problems are characterized by tons of what I call tame problems. Tame problems are little simple things that lend themselves to algorithms that would give us a lot more psychic time to apply ourselves to the wicked problems. So if we, if we automate ourselves into a point where all of our answers are stupid, we'll, this value proposition that I'm making doesn't make any sense. We have to maintain the ability to, to, solve, problem, to solve wicked problems while applying autonomy, questions of autonomy to the, to the tame problems. 
And so there has to be a strategy for how you do this in the building industry. And I'm, I'm starting to work this out at a very crude level, and I'm not sure it's even, I'm not even sure my thesis is any good here, but my thesis looks something like this. There's a hierarchy of these kinds of value propositions that are possible that start with very low end things like doing a better job and end up with very high end things like making buildings do the things that clients want to do, but that they, they, you cannot accomplish this strategy without theories of how the various players work together. So at the low end of the performance continuum, oh, and, and just let me say that, my graduate students are constantly accusing me of drawing meaningless mathematical curves because I like them and they look pretty and they make points, but they don't have much math associated with them. And my meaningless curve here basically is saying, as we move from left to right on the, on the continuum of performance opportunities, the left-hand side of this equation has relatively low value increase, but it's still interesting. But the right-hand side of this equation begins to accelerate the value proposition. And so at, on the left-hand side of this equation is like, okay, if the designers just want to play by themselves, they can use autonomous technologies to just do a better job at their current homework assignment. They can make sure their projects meet the budgets and the programs. They can make sure they're meeting proper design quality. They can do their current jobs better than they're doing them right now. That's, that would be good. There's not, that would be great. But it's kind of, um, it's, it's an expected thing. It's what, the, what clients are expecting to see happen. But once you begin to involve both designers and builders, you get into a different set of potential outcomes around program conformance and overall schedule and build quality and so forth. But the things that our customers in the building industry really care about is how our buildings work. And so once you in begin to involve all the players in the AEC process, you can get to these outcome-based value propositions that have to do with how is this building performing? What kind of energy is it using? What kind of embodied carbon is there? How easy is it to staff? How easy it, is it to maintain? But the nirvana, which maybe we'll get to someday if we can master these two questions of both autonomy and business model is getting these buildings to do the things that our clients built the buildings to do in the first place. Perform economically, make people healthier, improve test scores, and so on. And so what needs to happen if we're gonna do this, because global intergalactic theories of anything do not work in the building industry, is we have to start a bunch of experiments. There'll be a lot of experiments around technology and a lot of experiments around building propositions. We need to start a similar set of experiments on changing different kinds of strategies for changing the value propositions of the building industry itself. This is some work done by Maya Sharfi at Northeastern that looks at the different inputs and outputs of the AEC value proposition change, internal on the left and external on the right. I've been teaching a course for the last um, five years called Exploring New Values for Design Practice, where my, the assignment for the semester is design and architecture practice that generates its value by not charging fixed fees. You can do anything you think architects can do that you can get money for, but you cannot charge traditionally for your work. And I've seen 55 or so projects now, and you're starting to see some emergent themes, right? The first theme is verticalizing the value chain. In other words, having player A do something that player B normally does. Architects as developers, architects as fabricators, architects as construction managers. Second strategy is the one I call a spanning strategy, which is let's see if we can hook together two parts of the process in a way that can be more efficient. I'm not gonna own the processes, but I'm gonna bridge them. So I'm gonna become a designer of prefabricated systems. I'm not gonna prefabricate, I'm just gonna design them. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna work with my clients and do a whole bunch of work on post-occupancy data. I'm gonna organize that stuff and orchestrate it as a, as a, as a kind of knowledge source. And then the, what I thought was the most interesting, it kind of reflects what Kevin was talking about earlier, is statistically the vast majority of my students come up with these sort of you know, startup companies. It's what I call supporting ideas. Let's be an IPD consultant, let's do branding, let's do RFPs, let's do post-occupancy marketing, things that are extramural to the building industry. And for those of you who are educators in the architecture, there's a very strong interest here, which we see at, at schools across the country, in doing non-architectural things. These people don't want to practice. But who knows, maybe AI is gonna reduce the number of jobs they have anyway. Um, so if you, if you extrapolate on that logic for a moment and use that same sort of owner-architect dichotomy, there's a way to look at this that, that sort of says, here's, here's a technology strategy that you could think about as a, a way to begin thinking about this value proposition. 
the fundamental technological infrastructure in theory on the design side is supposed to be building information modeling. And on the construction side, you're starting to see the emergence of sort of three types of tools. Administrative stuff, the Procores and uh, uh, BIM 360s of the world, product and operational stuff about organizing all the stuff that goes on the job site, and then everything having to do with project geometry, specifications, and performance. But there's no, there's no clear stack. And then on the owner side, they, they get this thing called a plan room at the end of a project, which is whatever detritus the AEC cluster for their project discard, disgorges at the end of the project, and they're starting to collect a ton, a ton of operations data. But if you could find a way to connect these processes with a value proposition that has to do with my, my promise to you is that I'm going to make something happen, then you begin to see, you, you, you create a construct where these, there's a set of self-reinforcing data flows where design intent actually can inform, for example, the organization of a construction project. And construction logic can inform design at the same time while simultaneously letting everybody know what's going on and that owners can actively participate in this idea of collecting information about how their buildings are actually operating and therefore going forward. So we need a thesis for how this information might flow around in this kind of overall proposition. And so we, what, we're, what I'm really suggesting here is that we begin to experiment using autonomy as a catalyst with outcome-based delivery models. Delivery models that say, instead of buying my services for the lowest cost because I can't figure out any other measure, what I'd really like you to do is allow me to make a promise about something that's gonna happen, and then when that promise is fulfilled, pay me. And if that promise is not fulfilled, don't pay me. But it will raise the stakes and increase the value proposition accordingly. I'll just skip that. So let me conclude by suggesting that um, the, I think the reason that I was invited to speak here today was not because of my blinding insight about robots, because I have none, but more because I would like us to talk during the course of the day not just about what the instrumentation, what's the instrumental possibilities of a given technology are, but what that instru instrumentalization of a robot or another piece of autonomous technology actually means for how the, the systems work together. And having spent um, three very challenging years in my architecture career trying to build a very, very large complex building, I was just saying to Kevin that the only building type in the world that's more complex than a performing arts center is a nuclear power plant. And we built, we, built a, that, we built two performing arts centers down on Biscayne Boulevard, and it was really tough. Very, very tough. And most of the problems were not technical. They were about relationships and business arrangements and profit motivations and the flow of money. And so we have to think, we have to, we have to adjust our thinking about the strategies that we use for creating the systems in which we deploy these technologies. Um, couple, one of the best examples of this as, at least as a design practice, is a firm in Boston that you may know called Mass Design. They build hospitals in Africa for uh, partners in health. And Alan Ricks, who's one of the partners there, was teaching at school um, last spring. And he, he, he gave a lecture where he, he kind of encapsulated the value proposition of their practice, where he said, we have to show that good design delivers on the core mission of our partners. It is quantifiable, in this case, reducing infections, making recovery times faster, and increasing staff retention. Autonomous technologies in the building industry have, give us the opportunity to create these kinds of quantifiable outcomes, but they will not be realized unless we refactor the systems of delivery accordingly. And so I hope that can be a kind of a subtext for what we talk about later today. Thank you.